Thanks, Laura, and hello, everybody. Thanks for joining me for this uh, virtual book signing, virtual book release of my new book. I've been working on this thing for about a year and a half, and uh, a lot of work and a lot of love went into this thing. And I'm um, going to let you take a look at the final product here with this uh, online slideshow. So if you haven't seen the Logo Brainstorm book before, here it is. This is a big fat book. It's nine inches square. It's about 300 pages. It's my first large format hardcover book. So I was excited to get my first copies in the mail and realized just what a hefty object this thing is. Big, heavy, and colorful. So I'm going to dive right into the content of this thing. And I'm going to basically give you a tour of the book. And I know this is a virtual book signing. So since it's virtual, I won't be signing any books. But I will be guiding you through this thing and I'm going to do my best to make the content um, as relevant not only to the book but also to the logo process itself because I know that's why many or most of you signed up was to maybe catch a thing or two about the logo development, logo brainstorming and so we'll be talking about the book but I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to try to gear the conversation towards um, the book plus practical tidbits related to logos. So. Um, here's the cover, here's the spine. If you look at the far right hand edge of the, the pages, you'll see a little color breakout as the pages go through. Those are to help guide you through the book. If on the front cover on the far right hand side, you can see little tabs color coded. Those uh, represent each of the book's chapters and as you're summing through this thing, they help you find your place and help you use the book uh, however you want to use it. So right up front, one thing to um, to really get out there about this book is it's not really a book, or it's it's helpful not to think of it as a book. This thing is more of a tool, and to be more clear, what it really is is it's a toolbox. And you know how in real life, uh, toolboxes they have all kinds of drawers, and you have different things in different drawers. Well, this the, the book is kind of organized that way. It's meant to be shuffled through, drawers opened, drawers closed, tools taken out, tools put away, uh, much like a set of tools, rather than read start to finish like most books. Now, you could read this thing from start to finish, and you could go page by page, and it would probably uh, tell you a thing or two about the logo creation process, and that would be fine. But it's really not the way this is supposed to be used. I had a couple of goals when I was putting this thing together, and one, you know, because there are there are a ton of logo books out there, and I was at the How conference, and I was telling this other author that I was doing a book on logos, and he basically told me I was crazy because you know what a saturated segment of the market that is. There's there's so many books out there, so I had two goals with this thing. One was to make it different from anything that's out there, and the other goal was to do my best to make it awesome, you know, um, of course. So one thing I know I did, I know I succeeded in making a logo book that's different from anything that's out there, and you'll get a good look at the insides coming up here. And I'll just leave it up to you whether you decide to think this is awesome or not. So I'm going to give you a tour of the book, starting with the table of contents. After the introduction, the, the real chapters begin starting with a chapter called Beginnings, and after that, a six chapters that kind of run through the different major categories of logos and logo creation and logo components, chapters called symbols, monograms, typographic logos, type plus symbol, emblems, color. Not all logos fit into these categories, so I use the labels somewhat loosely in the book. But um, as a brainstorming tool, the book is organized you know, according to these types of logos. And the idea being you can turn to whatever area is most relevant to a project you're looking on, you're working on and get ideas for, for what you're doing. So starting with chapter one, beginnings. I'm a real believer in doing things the easy way and um, also, you know, which in professional terms usually means, you know, the quality still got to be top notch, but easy meaning not too many dead ends, not uh, ending up with a product that the client kind of questions at the end. I don't like doing things over, so I like to do a little homework up front. And it's probably never more important than when I'm working on a logo. 
um, I like to begin with a certain set of tasks that really get me aimed in the right direction and on target. And then I get, I start to feel more confident, more creative once I start doing the fun stuff, so when I start drawing pictures and doing sketches and brainstorming. And by the way, this is the only chapter in the book that's really text heavy. Um, this part looks more like a textbook. I think this chapter is only maybe 30 pages long or so. It's short, and the rest of the book is just jammed with images, as you'll see. But the beginnings chapter, because we're talking about specific strategies and tactics and ways of going about your business, lots of words here. I start off with a, a subhead, a subsection called Know Thy Client. And I'm sure most of you have worked on logos before, and you know whether the client is a major corporation or a friend who needs a logo, you got to know a thing or two about their tastes and their preferences preferences and what they expect from you. So I've got a section in here on the kind of conversations and the kind that you have with your client and the questions you ask and the things that you go over. Naturally, this is really important right up front and not really a, a part of the job that you want to take too many shortcuts on. And then we move ahead to what I think is probably the numero uno most important part of the logo preparation process. Um, who it's for. Even more important than knowing things about my client, I want to know who the client's um, customers are, who, who uses their services or their goods. I want to know about their tastes. It's really interesting, and I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this. A lot of clients, it's never really occurred to them that what they like in a logo, what they like in colors, may or may not be what their customers like. So sometimes I have a polite conversation with clients and try to bring them up to speed that we're really not trying to make ourselves, um, just ourselves ecstatic about this logo. It's more a matter of making the, um, the target audience ecstatic about the logo. So this is a section about evaluating who the logo is going to be for and why that's extremely important and how to go about doing that. Oops. Uh, next, I like to look at my rivals for a couple main reasons. I want to look at what's being done, what's already been done for my clients' competitors as far as their logos and stationery and branding goes. For one thing, I don't want to accidentally, you know, if I'm working in a vacuum, I might accidentally come up with a logo, a design that looks like something that's already out there. Naturally, that would be a disaster because you'd probably show up for your presentation meeting and you know, someone would say right away, well, that looks like so-and-so's logo, and, and you're dead in the water right there. So I like to do that research up front, and you know, the web makes this very easy now. I go online, and I, I look at practically everything in the world that's done in the neighborhood of my, my client's uh, business, so I can, I, I can try to do something different. And also, of course, I want to do something better than anything that's out there, if at all possible. I'll do my best to do something better and at the very least uh, distinct and unique, so it stands apart from the crowd. You may be up against some really excellent logos, depending on, on what segment of the market you're working in. So you know, if you're not so sure you can do something better, at least do something way different, something that stands out and is really excellent on its own terms. After this section of the book, we really get down to the meat of the creative process. Well, I think of the previous stuff as kind of the homework and the stuff that follows the homework for me is the fun part. We're all, I think, visual sort of people. I know I am. I know most designers are. But I'm always amazed at the power that words have in the brainstorming process, no matter what I'm working on. And it's especially true of logos. I like to start out with, with word lists, and I'll show you an example of this in just a second. Word lists that um, help ignite ideas. I've I've tried all kinds of different ways of brainstorming, and over the years, I've worked on a whole, whole bunch of logos and a whole lot of different projects. And I keep coming back to this one method as being the most efficient, the most um, productive, and leads to the best results. Here's what I'm talking about. So later on in the book, there is a logo for a fictitious person called Rowdy Jenkins and his blog. So Rowdy Jenkins Blog World. You'll see this logo in a minute. As a matter of fact, everything in the book is, is um, all the logos were created for fictitious companies or organizations, and they're all created by me for this book, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on and how that comes into play. So anyway, um, I created each of the book's logos in the same way as I would have created them if I were working for a client. And what I do here is I start out with word lists. 
And if you've got really good eyesight, or if your monitor is big enough, you can probably read this list clearly. And the column on the left is entitled Rowdy. So I write down the word, because you know part of Rowdy Jenkins' name, Rowdy. And I write down whatever comes to mind. First thing that came to mind was the word bronco, like a bucking bronco. If, you know, if I had started thinking after lunch, rather than after breakfast, I might have come up with a different first word. But it's just let your brain synapses fire and write down whatever comes to mind. So I've got bronco, boxing gloves, rock'em, sock'em robots, wrestling masks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, brainstorm this for a while. And then I'll make lists related to other words in the logo. Like I've got the word world down here in the middle of the page. And you know I could use, how could I depict the world? Because it's Rowdy Jenkins blog world. Well, I could use a globe, I could use a photo of a globe, a planet, a map style globe, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll, brain, I'll, I'll brainstorm all the different aspects of the logo and come up with word lists. This usually doesn't take too long. And if I'm working for a client, you know, it's a real job, uh, I'll probably brainstorm much more heavily than what you're looking at right here. But for the purposes of this book, I, um, I tried to get right to the point. Because I had to create between, I think my record one day is I created 25 logos for this book in one day. And more typically, I'd create between three and five per day. So I was cranking them out, and I got right to the point with these logos. So what I did here, and this is typical for a client job as well, I start looking at my word lists and combining words between columns and seeing what ideas come up in my head, combining words within one list, like one column. And I just happened to see this word, fire. So fire went into my head, and wild hair, and you know, you could look at any two words or any one word on this list and come up with 50 logo ideas if you had enough time. But I was working fast. I saw these two words, and bingo. Um, lower right-hand portion of this page, you see Rowdy Jenkins' blog world logo. And I've combined that with type later on in the book. So that's an example of how I use word lists to get things going. But there's an intermediate step between the word lists and the actual incarnation of the logo like you're seeing here. And that is thumbnail sketches. We've got a little section here in the beginnings chapter called Thinking Big with Little Pictures. I don't know about you, but I am crazy about doing thumbnail sketches. I think, you know, since the computer came along, of course, um, some people like to skip the thumbnail step sketch stage and go right to the computer. I suppose that works for some people. I'm personally hugely in favor of pen and paper brainstorming. When I, I've tried brainstorming on the computer, and every once in a while there's a kind of project where that works. But for the most part, when I brainstorm with the computer, I end up doing things that I know, that I know the computer will, will easily allow me to do. And if I'm sketching little you know, scratchy sketches or thumbnail sketches with paper and pen, I just do whatever I want. And my, my thumbnail sketches are probably among the most ugly and sloppy in the, in the entire world, but they do the job. Here's, here's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, this barely discernible sketch here is the word nucleus. I'm brainstorming ideas for a logo, a typographic logo using the word nucleus. And the idea comes into my head, oh, a circuit board. And um, believe it or not, that's what this thumbnail sketch represents, is a circuit board with the word nucleus in the middle. So this is just visual shorthand. I, I did this sketch probably in a matter of 1.5 seconds. And um, it's a visual note to self that when I get to the computer, I will uh, explore this idea. And, and here's the finished logo at the bottom of, of this page here. Oops. So you can see the transformation from this to this. So that's, how, that's what my thumbnail sketches look like. And I like when I do thumbnail sketches, I like to set a huge piece of paper in front of me. If I work on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, I'll do 8.5 by 11's worth of ideas. If I put a big drawing sheet of paper, a piece of butcher paper in front of me, I'll do that many ideas. I like to really thoroughly brainstorm using the word lists and the thumbnail sketches. And then when I jump onto the computer, I can really crank them out. I can, I can go directly to what I want, and improvements and alterations and additions and subtractions always happen when I move to the computer. But um, what I'm pointing out here in this chapter is it's a good way to begin a project with words and thumbnail sketches. So um, once you've read chapter one, if you choose to read that chapter, you get an idea of how projects might begin. And then comes the, the usage of the book itself. 
and now we're going to get into how you might use this book and how might it might help with a project, or at least you can consider using this book once you've, you've seen what I've got here. Say you're working on a logo, and you decide to explore typographic options for your logo, like just type, just lettering, no icon, no nothing else. Well, naturally, you'll go to your the, the book here and go to the typographic logos section. It's like opening that drawer of your toolbox. And within this chapter, and this is typical as far as format goes, and I'll go a little bit more into the typical format that's used throughout the book later on, but you'll get the idea of just looking at a few spreads here. The typographic logos chapter, it begins with uh, the right-hand page just totally full of straight from your font menu typefaces depicting of five different words that are fictitious company names for this book. And the idea being, you look at this page and you, you think to yourself, oh, what if I did use a typeface straight from the computer and didn't do any modifications or anything? Could I get away with that? And, you know, the answer depends on your project. I think every once in a very long time, I'll design a logo and it's pretty much just a straight up typeface, done deal. Um, maybe it's a real quick logo for a friend or something, but when I work for clients, I tend to want to modify letters, customize things, take a more personalized approach. But this spread, and it's the first page in the chapter, so the chapter starts out in pretty simple terms. In this spread, we're just looking at, hey, what about simple typeface solutions? And the way a person might use this book is they could look in the upper left-hand corner of the right-hand page, see the word alley cat in script, and just for a split second, ponder the idea, hey, what if I use script for my for my logo? Or you move to the next idea, what if I use kind of a hand, um, hand lettered idea or characters that are enclosed in ornate enclosures like the example at the upper right. So you're kind of getting the idea of how I've intended these pages to be. Is these are idea starters. You look at this stuff, it bounces off your brain and ideas form in your head. For me, that's a really quick and productive way to explore a lot of ideas with a lot of range in a short amount of time. And keep in mind, this book, of course, is 300 pages long. So when we got um, a page after page after page of ideas, you can cover a lot of ground fairly quickly by looking through certain sections of this book. Another page in the type typographic logos section. This page has to do with making subtle alterations to characters. And on the left-hand page, you'll see a glimpse of you know the text part of the spread, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. A spread talking about uh, ornate or geometric add-ons that could be used, you know, um, that could uh, come from letter forms or be used as backdrops for them. And this page is a, is, um, a good example of another thing that I've done throughout the book. Uh, this is in the typographic logo section, but you'll notice there are actually visual elements on these logos. It's no accident. Um, I like to kind of surprise my brain when I'm working on a project and go, okay, I know I think I'm doing it a certain way, but what if I did something completely different? So every once in a while in this book, I'll interrupt the flow of what's been going on and I'll say, hey, well, what if you did draw a mustache on your type or add um, graphic icons inside of a couple letters or on top of letters or dot the eyes with ornate um, symbols, something like that. So this is just a quick brainstorm page offered to kind of jumble things up and kickstart or potentially kickstart a different area of, of exploration. Often on the left-hand pages of a spread, I will also include, I've also included pages that have little how-to tidbits frame by frame. On this page you're looking at here with the alley cat lettering, I have really terrible handwriting and um, I, I guess I have very poor coordination with my hand because my brain can think of what I want, but my hand doesn't really perform the task very well. So when I need to do a, a handwritten bit of lettering for a logo or for a design project, what I do is I write out the word like a hundred times on several sheets of paper, and I'll go through and I'll clip out my favorite letters or connectors or swirls from each, uh, you know, from that whole set, tape them together, scan it, and come up with a complete product. So that little mini tutorial on this page has to do with that technique. If you, like me, are a little bit lacking in your handwriting skills, most of the mini tutorials like this have to do with software techniques. I should mention most of them are like, hey, try this in Illustrator, or, or here's a Photoshop thing you could, you could do. 
or having to do with the fundamentals of composition and um, aesthetics. So that's a, a quick look through the typographic logo section. The biggest chapter in the book is symbols, chapter two. Most of us, when we think of logos, you know, we are thinking of icons and we're thinking of symbols. So I, I gave a lot of uh, real estate in the book to this topic and tried to cover quite a great deal of territory with it. So in the symbols chapter, it's kind of like the typography chapter that came before. Lots of ideas presented according to a certain theme and the idea being you can look at a page like this, uh, let it spark ideas. This page um, highlights a tool that's available in Illustrator and InDesign, the Pathfinder panel, the Pathfinder operations. Those things are, to me, they're, they're fantastic for coming up with um, abstract icons such as the ones you're looking at here. Every one of the designs shown here was created by either adding or subtracting circles from squares, squares from circles, circles from circles, etc. to come up with a pretty wide variety of outcomes. And, you know, and this is not even the tip of the tip of the iceberg. You can do you know, an infinite amount of abstract or representational outcomes with the Pathfinder panel. I love that tool. I, I give a fair amount of attention to it in this uh, section of the symbols chapter. more symbols. Right in the middle of this page you'll see a design that looks like it's kind of splattered ink. That was actually um, the concentric circles were created by dipping three different size cups into a pool of coffee and pressing it against a piece of paper and scanning the results. And the idea here being like, all right, you think you're working on the computer with this logo. Well, what if you didn't use the computer? What if you used a paintbrush or coffee cups or who knows what else? Every once in a while an idea like that really takes you in the direction uh, that you should be going all along. More symbols. The large sample on this right-hand page, the kind of 3D theme, that was done with 3D rendering software. And I mention that because, you know, I usually use Adobe Illustrator or some Photoshop and or Photoshop and sometimes hand tools like brushes to create logos. But every once in a while, I'll pull out the 3D rendering software. And I use a program called Blender. It's a free open source program you get online and lots of forums to tell you how to use it. It's a pretty powerful program. It's very powerful. And I'm not even a kindergarten level user. I'm like a pre-preschool level. I'm, I'm a toddler when it comes to uh, 3D software. But I have invested just enough time to learn how to make circles and squares and blobs and to twist them around a little bit. And um, I can, I can do some pretty good logo type work with those programs, even with that level of knowledge. So I mentioned that because if you're, if you feel overwhelmed, if you looked at the interface for a program like this and feel scared of it like I did, um, and there is a learning curve, that's for sure, just jump in maybe and get a you know, preschool level of uh, understanding with a program. It'll add to your, your repertoire of tools that you can apply to logo projects and all kinds of design projects. So let's take a quick breakdown of an anatomy of this, of a typical spread in this book. And this will like complete your picture of how most of the logo brainstorm books work. There's a few different kinds of spreads, so I'll concentrate on what you're looking at here first, because that's the majority of the book's spreads are formatted like this. On the right-hand pages, that's where all the visuals are. And you, you, know, you, you look at a sample and you think, hey, what if I use translucency effects? What if I spiraled my design around a common center, et cetera, et cetera? And maybe a user, if they're really deep into an icon project, they might go one by one through a page like this and go, what if I did that? And of course, the idea here isn't to copy anything you see. I know none of us are copycats. But um, rather to just let the idea go in through your eyes, bounce off your brain, and connect with other ideas, and let the magic of whatever the brain does happen on its own, and um, see what kinds of things come out on from, from your head for any given project. On the left-hand page, we haven't talked about the text pages yet, but um, as you might expect, the bulk of the left-hand page is just kind of a general rundown of, of the topic. And that's all well and good, but the, I think the more useful part of these pages are the captions. And the captions naturally relate, they're key to the images on the right-hand pages. and um, they don't just caption and say, hey, you're looking at a, a logo with squares over here or, or the 
they, I tried not to say the obvious with these captions. Most of the time, they ask questions like, hey, what if you tried this? Or did you think about this aspect of what you're looking at? And you know, sometimes they're loosely connected with the images, sometimes they're tightly connected. But I even make the suggestion a couple times in the book that when you're brainstorming, you may want to try the thing where you just take a piece of paper and you cover up the images on the right and you just read through this text. It's really interesting to me what happens when you, you know, read through these captions and you apply it to what you're working on and just kind of let things ha happen on their own. You know, this is the logo brainstorm book and that's just another way you can use it to brainstorm for ideas. About every, I think it's about every 10 or 12 spreads in the book, I kind of break things up, give you some relief from the heavy duty images and include a, a spread with um, quotes from, you know, everyone from Alfred Hitchcock to Albert Einstein to, you know, great designers like Paul Rand and movie makers like David Lynch. Quotes regarding creativity and brainstorming and art. And I tried to find quotes that I hadn't heard before or seen before quotes that didn't seem overused to me. And on the right-hand page of each of these spreads, I did a little essay myself about a certain aspect of the logo creation process. And did I mention that the book has exercises? If you choose, um, the back of each chapter, you know, the last uh, two or three spreads has exercises related to the things that have been talked about in that chapter. Naturally, no one's required to do these things. Um, but if you want, they're there, and I think there's typically four or five or six exercises related to each chapter. If you are a, an instructor and are looking for course material, lesson plans, feel free. Uh, look at this stuff, see if anything here might work with a, a class that you're working with, or just do them on your own, whatever you like, or ignore them completely if you'd rather. Let's kind of buzz through the rest of the chapters here. I'm going to try to, you know, finish up in the next 10 or 15 minutes. We have time for some questions. Um, but I do want to let you have a peek at each of the chapters that come here. And um, this is one of my favorites, the emblems chapter. To me, it's kind of a graphic designer's dream job when they get a client that wants, you know, an ornate construction of type, borders, ornaments, backgrounds, patterns, line work, color, et cetera, et cetera. And I put those under the broad category of emblems in this chapter. And like the rest of the book, I begin with uh, brainstorming prompts. Here's a spread, I think it's the first spread in the chapter, that just says, okay, you, what about enclosing your design? Now, not all emblem designs have enclosures. Sometimes they're just constructions of type and or images. But often they are uh, things built within and around enclosures. So here's a spread designed to help you get the creative juices going regarding like well, what kind of structure could you use to enclose your design. And again, none of these uh, images are meant to be lifted uh, as they are and used for logos. But uh, you know, there's an ornate logo. You'll see an ornate enclosure at the center of this spread that you see there. The idea being you could look at this and go, what if I look through my font catalog of ornate um, dingbats and decorations and constructed them into some kind of enclosure around a logo. Maybe that would be just the thing for what you're working on, and maybe not. If not, then move on. A little bit more of the emblems page, some text talking about what's going on. I mentioned before, oh, real quick here, um, I love ornamentation. I like ornaments and um, in all kinds and combining classical ornaments with classical type or classical ornaments with contemporary type. You know, it's, it's kind of the thing these days. It's been the thing forever, but it, the, the look of it shifts over time. So there's a page or two devoted to that type of material here in the emblems chapter. And I started to mention that um, earlier I talked about how I created every logo in this book um, just for this book. And that's one thing that sets it apart from other books on logos. And there's nothing wrong with those other books. And what I'm talking about are the, the typical and often very good books that are collections of the author's work or the author will act as a curator and collect a lot of logos from around the world and put them in the form of um, a showcase for you to look through, get ideas, get inspired by. I have books like that and I love them. Um, the difference between those books and this book is that all the logos here were created just for this book, and each logo in this book is really designed to make a, a particular point 
No, you can take whatever point you want from any logo that you look at in here. But I did have something specific in mind when I presented each of the logos in the book, and usually the captions kind of reveal what I had in mind. So, um, yeah, like I said, I'm not trying to say that this is the way to cover the topic of logos, but this is what sets it apart from other books on logos, and um, either readers will like it or they won't. And I, when I created this thing, I thought, I want to create the logo brainstorming book that I wish I had on my desk all these years when I was creating creating logos. So that's what you're looking at here. And this is one of the reasons, this spread here illustrates one of the reasons I love working with Howe Publishing on these books. They're a real hands-off publisher. They're, they're very helpful to me during the process of creating a book. You know, they, they proof all my text, they look over things, they find my grammar mistakes, and if there's something that's not quite working out for them, they'll raise a flag and say, what if we tried something else here? But 99% of the time, they just um, let me go about my business, creating pages, creating the book, making it look the way I think it should look. And um, this spread is an example of something I really enjoy doing. I like just uh, putting a huge graphic across the face of a spread and putting a little bit of type with it as a way of interrupting the kind of dense um, display of material that appears elsewhere. You come to a page like this and it's just like, wow, what if I put giant wings on this logo and included a globe and four different typefaces and an ornate backdrop and just kind of went bigger than life with this logo. So I like interrupting the flow of the thoughts in this book with this, these kinds of like large impact spreads, both because as a designer, I, I really like this kind of thing and it's really fun to construct them. And also because I like the kinds of ideas and the way they can work with the reader's brain. Typographic constructions as part of the emblem chapter. I mentioned right up front that the book's got kind of a color coding system. This is my, I think this is my 13th book on either design or digital photography. All my books are aimed, for, aimed towards graphic designers, no matter what the subject is. Um, and I'm getting better at making them uh, useful, uh, usable, I should say. Uh, and, and in this case, you know, I, I wanted to color code the pages so that if you're working on a certain kind of logo, you can real quickly flip to exactly where you want to be. You can find your places. You can find what, different ideas. Um, anyway, it's, it's color coded. And one, one of my favorite things about that is I love the effect when the book is closed and get the kind of rainbow look along the edge. It's a, it's a nice look. Monograms. I spent a chapter talking about monograms. This is the deal where you use the client's, maybe the first initial in a client's name or, the, or a set of initials or a trio of initials, whatever, and make a logo out of that. Sometimes it's kind of an underexplored area of logo making. So I wanted to spend some time talking about it in the book and had a lot of fun with this chapter. Get to play with typefaces and the idea of icons all at once. More complex uh, monograms. This chapter deals with adding a, or I should say this spread, adds, deals with adding notes of perspective or dimension or depth to a monogram, either in subtle form or, or more obvious. More in the monogram chapter. Here I'm uh, talking about non-conventional, non okay, I should say, all of the letters you see on this page, the monograms, none of them come from typefaces. These are custom created letters. Some of them are created from ornaments or from decorative line work. And even um, coffee beans, the, obviously the one in the center is a photograph of five coffee beans in the form of the letter X. And you might look at this and go, yeah, what if I took a picture of something and made a logo out of it? The lowercase g at the bottom left of that page is uh, just a watercolor painting of a uh, lowercase g for, inspired by the Requiem family of letters, which, which I really like. More monograms. Most of these have um, symbols either incorporated within the letter forms or behind or on top of the letter forms. Got a trio of Volkswagens pulling a capital W down at the bottom. Yeah, why not? Another high impact spread. Most of the time when we work on logos, at least most of the time when I work on logos, I'm asked to combine an icon with type somehow. You know, large percentages, large percentage of the logos 
or signatures, if you'd rather call them that, out there are type plus symbol. So this chapter gives a lot of ideas in terms of how you might arrange things, a horizontal format, a vertical format, a square format, um, symmetrical, asymmetrical, and on and on and on, along with different size associations. And well, you know, there's a lot of different uh, compositional and aesthetic considerations to take into account when you're combining icons and type. And this chapter covers a lot of that. One of the main things that um, designers ask about, uh, you know, especially students, is how do I know if a typeface belongs with this icon? So that's a, a major thing that's talked about in this chapter. And you know, the short answer I always give to that question is um, typefaces and icons should either go very well together or com be completely different from each other. You know, don't be uh, lukewarm about the association. more type plus icon examples. This page um, makes the point uh, in a really loud visual manner of, of this idea. Say you're working on a logo and for a coffee shop. You come up with this um, cartoon character you see at the left side of this spread and you like it. You're like, oh, this is perfect. This is just what my client is going to love. That's the point in the project where you shouldn't necessarily sit back and relax and just add some type to the logo. That's where you take that thing and you really take advantage of what the computer can do for you, and that is um, explore options. Throw that thing into the computer. Well, you probably created it in the computer in the first place, so put it in a fresh document, and then just start going crazy with typefaces, arrangements, um, maybe special effects, but play around with it for a while, and maybe a good long while. It's amazing how often you end up in territory you never thought you'd even look into, and that's where your winning idea comes from. Another example of uh, letter form replacement, the O in this logo, is, uh, is actually its icon. And the entire thing is, that's not a typeface, it's just a geometric uh, letter forms created in Illustrator. a spread devoted to the letters O and Q and how they can be replaced with visual material. And lastly, the last chapter in the book, um, and I put this in at the end of the book, Color, because for me that's usually something that I wait until the very end of a project to, to think about. Well, I might have thoughts the whole time, but I don't start applying logo colors to my logos until I'm pretty much done with them. Um, otherwise, I think they're just a distraction. You know, what's the point of, of painting anything up if it's not finalized or getting there? So anyway, I saved that chapter for last, and um, it's a short chapter, but it, it goes into a lot of depth, and I, I was kind of surprised how little real estate in the book I needed to talk about color, because when I got down to it, I realized something I think I've intuitively figured out over the years, and that is color isn't uh, the crazy complicated topic that we might think it is. You know, there's some color theory talked about in this chapter, and the word theory alone puts a lot of people off. But, you know, big bad color is really just a, a pussycat once you get to know it. You just have to kind of figure out what works, what doesn't work in general terms, understand a little bit of color theory, and you can break it down into like um, four or five different formulas of color combina combinations. And I'm talking here about things like complementary colors, split complements, triads, all those words are are talked about in this chapter. I think I go over each one of those in one spread, in, in, on spreads of their own, along with some other color terms. And then it's a matter of looking at how bright or muted the colors should be, and should they all be bright, should they all be muted, should they be mostly muted with one bright accent color, and so on and so forth. So this chapter goes into some of that material, and I take um, icons from earlier in the book and just color them up a few different ways, and I talk about what's going on there. and how you might apply it to your projects. This spread talks about complementary color schemes and um, the fact that you know most of us know what complementary colors are. They're opposing colors on the color wheel. But sometimes we forget that um, we can use bright colors or muted colors as complements or a bright and a muted color. A lot of variation possible even in those palettes. More color combinations. Um, 
triadic color schemes, that's um, equally spaced colors from around the color wheel, applied to a, an illustrative logo. Now, that logo is featured earlier in the book where I talk about, um, hey, you know, what about setting Illustrator or Photoshop aside and pulling out a wood block and cutting your logo that way? Might be the perfect deal for something you're working on. The fun part comes when you get to color it later on. With this logo, I did the, the dark line work with a wood block print, you know, cut it out with a knife, and um, then I got to color it in Photoshop later on, which gives me a lot of, um, I, I get to take advantage of both worlds, the strengths of both uh, hands-on media and computer media. More color ideas. So that's the, that's the end of chapter to the Logo Brainstorm book. And I guess that's pretty much everything I've got to show you. And I know Laura's going to pop back in here and we're going to talk about some other things. I'm going to make one quick mention here. Um, and Laura probably will too. But I always want to um, make a little plug for political reasons and because I love my publisher, HowDesign.com. If by any chance you're interested in picking up a copy of, that, of this book, it's available in the usual places all over the place. But um, I know HowDesign.com has it. And speaking of logos in this book, uh, keep an eye on the How University website, and Laura might have more information here too. I'm going to be doing a course this fall online going through the logo creation process in four weeks. And it won't be a homework-heavy course, but it'll, it'll be kind of a hands-on thing. And most of the content is based on what you're looking at in the Logo Brainstorm book. So I'm going to hand things back over to you, Laura. Okay, great. We actually have a ton of questions, and so I've made kind of every effort to um, to find consistencies and you know ask the questions that the most most of you want to hear and get answers to. And um, and I've kind of put this first question in context because there was a lot of people, you know, in the books and the kind of ideas and concepts that you go through. Um, you're talking about kind of how to get those, you know, creative juices flowing. How to get those ideas kind of started. But what if, you know, the client says, well, this is the direction that we'd like you to take. And, you know, uh, or this is this is something that we find really interesting, this, this logo here. Um, so we'd like it to look kind of like this. Or, you know, we want it to say this, but be really elegant, you know. And sometimes you have those kind of constraints. So when you're presented with those kinds of um, kind of challenges, do you kind of set all that aside and dive into the brainstorming and then take it into consideration later? Or what's your process? What do you recommend for people? Yeah, that's just a really good question. Of course, I can fully relate to all of that. Um, I think most clients have something in mind when they begin a, a logo process, and depending on their personalities, they may be more insistent upon those ideas than other people might be. Um, I always remember that um, I'm a commercial designer and not a fine artist, so I, I do work for somebody else when I'm creating logos. If I go into a meeting and, and they, I'm told, we like this, we want our logo to be kind of like this, um, I definitely don't ignore it. When I come and I show ideas, though, um, I will make darn sure to show an idea that's um, along the lines of what they've talked about. And who knows, maybe what they want is exactly what I think they need. And if not, I will give them what they want. But always, you know, uh, I try to, you know, without um, sounding pompous or anything, I try to have artistic integrity. Like I won't show a logo that I think is a, is a terrible thing just because a client insists on it. If um, the client wants something that I absolutely don't agree with or I don't want to produce, uh, I, I won't work on it. I'll, have, I'll just uh, give them the name of somebody to, else that might work on the project. But that doesn't really, I don't know if that's ever happened to me. Usually I can hear the client out, we'll talk about it, and I might suggest, um, yeah, that's a really good idea. Let's tweak it a little bit so it doesn't look too close to such and such competitor. And I'll show them that idea in the meeting. But typically I show between three and five ideas at the first presentation meeting. And that's just going to be one of them. So I'll show that idea, and then I'll show four more ideas, say, that are maybe what I think the logo should look like. And I wouldn't, I don't, I can't st cite any statistics for like what percentage of the time my ideas get chosen compared to what they had in mind. But my general feeling is that usually they they um, they like what they see when it represents what they had asked for or close to what they had asked for. But when they see other ideas coming from me, you know, and we're supposed to be professionals, right? Like we have our, our finger on the pulse of fashion and and trend and what the public will respond to. So we'll show some ideas that we think are good. And very often the client will be fully on board instantly. They'll you know, forget that old thing we were talking about. Let's, let's go with ideas B and C and kind of um, maybe a mixture there. Or we love idea D and let's just use that. 
So I definitely listen to what clients are asking for, and I try to address it. I try to be courteous and responsive to them, and I, I want to keep them as a client, client probably, so I'll be nice. And I'll show them what they've asked for, maybe with some variations, and I'll also, if necessary, go in a completely different direction if I think it'll fit much better. So that was actually another question that a lot of people had was related to how many concepts you usually present to a client. And you said three to five, but does that mean you present um, three to five concepts with different logo ideas related to each one or three to five total? Usually um, three to five is kind of my magic number and three whenever possible. It's definitely possible to um, overwhelm a client with choices. My goal always is to um, give them a problem. The problem being they love everything so much they can't decide. You know, then you're kind of a hero when that happens. So that's I never show something that I wouldn't be completely happy if they chose. And you know, I may have fifth favorites myself when I show things and um, they, I set that aside when I go into the meeting. But I, three is a good number and it's three distinctly different ideas. And uh, sometimes I'll have my back, my laptop with me, and on the laptop might be a few variations of each idea, you know, that I developed during the course of the, the project. And I can pull those out if necessary. I won't even mention that I've got them when I go into the meeting. I just put three ideas out on the table. And um, one thing I like to do real quick, I'll mention: um, everyone has different ways of presenting. I'm I'm not a great salesperson. I I let my work do the selling because uh, you know I'll just make a mess of it if I try to talk too much. But I um. What I like to do is just put all my ideas out on the table at once because I, it's kind of like the way the marketplace works. If you're shopping and you're looking through a shelf of products, your eyes will go towards the logos and the presentations that you like best, that you're attracted to the most. And it's kind of neat to do this. You put down three ideas on the table, five ideas, and people just start looking them over and they immediately start tending towards one or another. It's a neat process and it kind of keeps me out of it. I kind of, you know, I, I tell clients this up front, um, these logos should either wow you on their own or not and it it has nothing to do with how I might explain how or why I got to this conclusion those questions can come later so I let the logos do their own talking and I like to um, offer a, a wide range of conversation visually speaking with the logos so I'll have a pure typographic idea perhaps and something that's image heavy and something that's kind of a combination or some more urban and gritty and something that's traditional and nice if it's a client that I know is going to want to see a lot of different ideas, I think I might go up to five or six. But I, other than that, it's, a, it's usually a three logo presentation to begin with. Sometimes, too, um, challenges with clients kind of, um, you know, with the early creative development process kind of start with um, just sometimes clients don't know how to express themselves. Like, so when you're yeah. trying to tease kind of tease kind of little nuggets of information out, what kinds of questions do you um, find are useful in that conversation? Like when you're talking to a client, what, you know, when you're trying to get to what they're looking for, what kinds of questions have you found useful? Yeah, that's really, really important. And I, I spend a little bit of time on that in the book. Um, there are both questions that are asked and questions that you don't have to ask. Um, and I'll start by talking about the second one. When I walk into a client's office, I'm already recording um, art on the walls. Or what's the man or the woman wearing that I'm meeting with? You know, you can. You, we're, we're trained, right, to pick up on these kind of visual cues. So I guess I do it both consciously and unconsciously. And I'm really taking note of the office's decor, of the, the dress of the clients, the way the conference room looks. Um, it's surprising how many, how much visual cues you can get from that, and some of that's some of that stuff is good news and some of it's bad news. Um, and then I, I definitely really um, query the client about their tastes and I, I like to ask clients to um, show me things that they like, show me things that they don't like and I, I give them these, these requests before the meeting like bring a stack of things, you know, are there things online that you can show me that you think are fantastic or things that you think completely fail. Once you start doing that then you can um, then you can start talking the same language pretty quickly. Everyone, you know, there's a problem where people think that the way they view the world is the way everyone views the world. And one of the first things I like to have happen when I'm meeting clients is just uh, the subtle realization and acceptance of the fact that we're all looking at the world differently. And what we really need to do is find out how the target audience is viewing the world and kind of set our own tastes aside temporarily if necessary. And um, really look at it through the target audience's eyes. So I do ask a lot of questions about that, mostly in terms 
of show me what you mean because a person can say they like a certain thing but whatever words they use may or may not um, mean the same thing to me as it means to them but when they show me a picture of an ad or a logo that they love or hate I'll pretty quickly know exactly what they're talking about and that'll help steer my ideas and sometimes it leads to more conversations that they might dislike something and I might think well actually that's exactly where the target audience is so you know a gentle and diplomatic conversation I never get into yelling matches about this stuff so I, I try to be diplomatic and, and say Actually, you know, let's look at this. these magazines that, that our target audience looks at. Let's look at their websites. This is exactly what they love. And we might have to put on that hat when we review the, the logo ideas in a couple of weeks. And real quick, one thing I, I also like to do that's connected with this is when I begin the presentation meeting a couple of weeks later, I like to recap what we talked about in the first meeting and maybe show some examples. Like, this is where we left off. We decided that this was a good look, this was a bad look, we liked these colors, and this was the stuff I put into my brain and into the mixing pot and came up with the following five ideas using. And then when you've kind of gotten to where you um, have zeroed in on some, some strong concepts that you'd like to show a client, how, how long do you sleep on it before you're like, yeah, this is done or this is in good shape or, you know, how do you know when something's finished or at least yeah. in the state to kind of present it? That's another just fantastic question. Um, I've experimented that with that over the years whenever time allows. Like, is it how much, how, for how much time should I put something in the drawer and not look at it before I really evaluate it? And, um, you know, everyone has that experience where they see things with fresh eyes after putting it aside for a little while. So um, my, the big thing for me is I used to get things done, you know, as close to an hour before a meeting, spend all nighters doing stuff. I don't do that anymore. I, I honestly try to get a logo done about a week before the meeting happens. Um, I mean, done and done good so that, you know, I could go to the meeting that very minute if I had to. But a lot of times it's that final week of it having it sit around or a couple of days at least where you, you, everyone's had this experience. You'll wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go, oh, what if I put this thing in an enclosure or added an ornament to this this deal or you know who knows what comes in your mind at three o'clock in the morning but tweaks to your idea that take it from being a good idea to a really good idea or an absolutely winning idea and my experience is like those kind of tweaks generally happen only when you finish the logo early you know finish the logo early and maybe set it aside and let it percolate for a few days and then the day before the meeting you might go in and just kind of uh, spruce it up that extra amount makes all the difference. I think sometimes you know the logo is improved by about a hundred percent during that last week. So it's very important to me to finish early and to set things aside when possible, review them with fresh eyes. Um, another thing just popped into my mind that I'll pass along. Whenever I'm working on um, icons, whether they're representational or abstract, I like to hold them up in the mirror. It's a way of tri tricking my eyes and my brain into thinking they're seeing something they haven't seen before. And it's, it's really interesting how your brain suddenly um, finds weak spots in the design or clumsy curves or, or awkward balance. Um, so I, I often take things into the, the hallway and hold them up in a mirror to give my eyes a fresh look at things, too. I know that's a little bit of a tangent, but I hope that all answers your <laughs> Nothing question. Nothing wrong with that. Um, we have we have one listener who's um, kind of ha like when you when you're working with a company or you know say you're even in house you know how how do you know uh, when it's time for a redesign like you know what kinds of things maybe happen uh, you know around the company or is it should it be kind of initiated more internally like if there was you know some some change that you know where the the current identity you know isn't relevant anymore like what kinds of um, evidence do you think is um, is relevant to some of those kinds of decisions when you're deciding whether or not to redesign as opposed to just, you know, I need a logo. What about I need a new version of the one we have? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, all these are good questions. I've never worked in an in-house department and been, you know, more or less stuck with an existing logo for a long period of time. So I'm going to answer it as best I can. I think that um, it's kind of the thing where as designers, you know, we're the ones who should be making that call or suggesting it to people who whose job it isn't to pay attention to this stuff. You know, other people do other things for a living. They're usually our clients. And, but it is our job to really um, 
keep an eye on what's happening to, to look at magazines like How and, and other magazines like Print that have like um, compilations of the year's best logos and the year's best work and so forth, and do that consistently and constantly so we can really know kind of the, the direction that things are moving. If you just take a snapshot of the way graphic design looks today, but you've never looked at it yesterday, you, re you won't know if things are kind of moving towards the grungy look or away from the grungy look, et cetera, et cetera. But if you keep track of things over time, you not only see what's happening in the design, but you also see the directions that things are going. And this ends up giving you a sense for, um, is my logo out of date? Like um, maybe, maybe you went too crazy with the three-dimensional icon look a few years back. You know, not to say that that's a bad idea, but it was a little bit out of hand maybe three or four years ago. And so maybe the puffy logo looks wrong now. So maybe you'll just kind of look at it. And then you have to convince your boss, I suppose, or other coworkers that, hey, we should rethink this. And that might be a matter of collecting samples of good-looking competitors' works. You know, there's nothing like seeing what competitors are doing if it's better than what your company is doing to convince you. That's that, survey. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So think, looking at what's out there and just kind of making a case for, hey, we got to keep up with things. Very good. Well, I think um, that's a good place to kind of um, wrap up. I do want to announce um, the winner for those of you who have um, hung in there with us to the end of a copy of Jim's book and also a free registration to his upcoming How Design University course, How to Design a Logo from Brainstorm to Finish. And um, that winner is Michelle Hoffman. So, Michelle, I will connect with you offline. I've got your email address to get your contact information, um, and we'll get you set up. And then also, um, if you didn't win, um, you can uh, get a copy of Jim's book on mydesignshop.com, and you can get 20% off um, for registering today uh, with the code LOGOB20. And you'll get that code and a link to My Design Shop um, in the email you'll receive thanking you for attending today's session. Uh, and then if you're interested in Jim's upcoming course, um, you can visit howdesignuniversity.com uh, for more information about what will be covered. And you can get a discount off of that as well with Jim's uh, referral code, which is jkraus, and that will get you $40 off the cost of tuition. So that is it from us. Um, Jim, thanks so much for this. It was really fun, and I know everybody really got a lot out of it. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. All right, have a good day. All right, thank you. Bye.